Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr. Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr. Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings I've heard about, together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, People gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B-R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a higher altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips... What about alien abduction? Ah, uh, 
Well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I've found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rock Hoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. This departs at sundown each day and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. 
There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the national park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices you may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area? Or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children, or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses which, incidentally, are the most common. And for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings, things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs, are all in good working order, because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order may be a very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So, until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk from a series of lectures on the survival of our planet. Professor Samson talks about endangered species of flora and fauna. First, you'll have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic in this series of lectures on our planet is about ensuring the survival of our very important plant and animal species. In this lecture, I want to discuss one way that we can do this. No one will ever see a huge dinosaur thundering through the forest. No one will ever see a paradise parrot flash its rainbow colours across the sky. The fact is that many animals and plants have been wiped out. Sadly, they are extinct. It is too late for them. Extinction is forever. We can't do anything about the species that have already disappeared. But today, there are many animals and plants that could still become extinct in the future if we do not act now. They are endangered. The African elephant and rhinoceros 
have become endangered because of the value of their tusks. Australian parrots and reptiles are smuggled onto planes because certain people in other countries are prepared to pay thousands of dollars for them. And there are many other species around the world that are endangered because they no longer have a place in which to live and reproduce safely. The main cause of extinction is the destruction of habitats. A habitat contains all that a living thing needs to survive. Space, light, water, food, shelter and opportunities for reproduction. The population of the world is growing rapidly and this is placing great demands on land and resources for housing and for growing food. When vegetation is cleared and swamps are drained for agriculture, mining and suburbs, or when rivers are dammed to store water, plants are destroyed and animal life is threatened. In other words, humans are changing and destroying the habitats of animals and plants, which is in turn reducing their chances of survival. So how can we conserve habitats and help save endangered species? Well, one way is to protect their habitats permanently in national parks or nature reserves. National parks have been created in many countries. They encourage people to enjoy the beauty and diversity of the animals and plants that live there without harming them. By supporting and visiting these parks, people can become more aware of the species that live there and how the parks work to protect them. It is very important that, when visiting a national park, we keep them safe for future generations of plants and animals by obeying a few rules. Firstly, follow the fire regulations. Don't throw cigarettes or build fires, except at certain times of the year in especially allocated areas and facilities. Secondly, remember to leave pets at home. Pets, such as cats or dogs, can hunt birds or other small animals. Some pets might even escape and become a serious threat. Thirdly, place all rubbish in a bin or take it home. Plastic bags or leftover food are dangerous to the animals and harm the environment. Don't pick the flowers or damage the plants. Flowers create the next generation of the plant. Also, for the same reason, birds' eggs must be left in their nests. The loss of species in the past is sad. However, there is hope for the future. Despite the demands of our increasing population, we can work to protect the plant and animal species we still have. So I would like to conclude by saying that I believe that, with strong public awareness and support of these national parks and reserves, the future of endangered species can be ensured. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.